The Night of the Long Knives German, Nacht der Langen Messer, or the Rome Purge, also called Operation Hummingbird German, Unternehmen Calibri, was a purge that took place in Nazi Germany from June 30 to July 2, 1934, when Adolf Hitler, urged on by Hermann Göring and Heinrich Himmler, carried out a series of political extrajudicial executions intended to consolidate his hold on power in Germany, as well as to alleviate the concerns of the German military about the role of Ernst Röhm and the Sturmabteilung the Nazis' own mass paramilitary organization. Nazi propaganda presented the murders as a preventive measure against an alleged imminent coup by the SA under Rome, the so-called Rome Putsch. The primary instruments of Hitler's action, who carried out most of the killings, were the Schutzstaffel SS paramilitary force under Himmler, and the Gestapo, the secret police. Many of those killed in the purge were leaders of the SA, the best known being Rome himself, the SA's chief of staff and one of Hitler's longtime supporters and allies. Leading members of the socialist-leaning Strasserist faction of the Nazi party, including its figurehead, Gregor Strasser, were also killed, as were establishment conservatives and anti-Nazis, such as former Chancellor Kurt von Schleicher and Bavarian politician Gustav Ritter von Kahr, who had suppressed Hitler's Munich Beer Hall Putsch in 1923. The murders of SA leaders were also intended to improve the image of the Hitler government with a German public that was increasingly critical of thuggish SA tactics. Hitler saw the independence of the SA and the penchant of its members for street violence as a direct threat to his newly gained political power. He also wanted to conciliate leaders of the Reichswehr, the German military, who feared and despised the SA as a potential rival, in particular because of Rome's ambition to merge the army and the SA under his own leadership. Additionally, Hitler was uncomfortable with Rome's outspoken support for a second revolution to redistribute wealth. In Rome's view, President Hindenburg's appointment of Hitler as Chancellor on January 30, 1933 had brought the Nazi Party to power, but had left unfulfilled the party's larger goals. Finally, Hitler used the purge to attack or eliminate German critics of his new regime, especially those loyal to Vice-Chancellor Franz von Papen, as well as to settle scores with old enemies. At least 85 people died during the purge, although the final death toll may have been in the hundreds, with high estimates running from 700 to 1,000. More than a thousand perceived opponents were arrested. The purge strengthened and consolidated the support of the Wehrmacht for Hitler. It also provided a legal grounding for the Nazi regime, as the German courts and cabinet quickly swept aside centuries of legal prohibition against extrajudicial killings to demonstrate their loyalty to the regime. The Night of the Long Knives was a turning point for the German government. It established Hitler as the supreme administrator of justice of the German people, as he put it in his July 13 speech to the Reichstag. Before its execution, its planners sometimes referred to the purge as Hummingbird German, Calibri, the codeword used to send the execution squads into action on the day of the purge. The codename for the operation appears to have been chosen arbitrarily. The phrase, Night of the Long Knives, in the German language predates the killings and refers generally to acts of vengeance. Hitler and the Sturmabteilung saw. President Paul von Hindenburg appointed Hitler Chancellor on January 30, 1933. Over the next few months, during the so-called Gleichschaltung, Hitler dispensed with the need for the Reichstag of the Weimar Republic as a legislative body and eliminated all rival political parties in Germany, so that by the middle of 1933 the country had become a one-party state under his direction and control. Hitler did not exercise absolute power, however, despite his swift consolidation of political authority. As Chancellor, Hitler did not command the army, which remained under the formal leadership of Hindenburg, a highly respected veteran field marshal. While many officers were impressed by Hitler's promises of an expanded army, a return to conscription, and a more aggressive foreign policy, the army continued to guard its traditions of independence during the early years of the Nazi regime. To a lesser extent, the Sturmabteilung SA, a Nazi paramilitary organization, remained somewhat autonomous within the party. The SA evolved out of the remnants of the Freikorps movement of the post-World War I years. The Freikorps were nationalistic organizations primarily composed of disaffected, disenchanted, and angry German combat veterans founded by the government in January 1919 to deal with the threat of a communist revolution when it appeared that there was a lack of loyal troops. 
A very large number of the Freikorps believed that the November Revolution had betrayed them when Germany was alleged to be on the verge of victory in 1918. Hence, the Freikorps were in opposition to the new Weimar Republic, which was born as a result of the November Revolution, and whose founders were contemptuously called November criminals. Captain Ernst Röhm of the Reichswehr served as the liaison with the Bavarian Freikorps. Röhm was given the nickname, the Machine Gun King of Bavaria, in the early 1920s, since he was responsible for storing and issuing illegal machine guns to the Bavarian Freikorps units. Röhm left the Reichswehr in 1923 and later became commander of the SA. During the 1920s and 1930s, the SA functioned as a private militia used by Hitler to intimidate rivals and disrupt the meetings of competing political parties, especially those of the Social Democrats and the Communists. Also known as the Brownshirts or Stormtroopers, the SA became notorious for their street battles with the Communists. The violent confrontations between the two contributed to the destabilization of Germany's interwar experiment with democracy, the Weimar Republic. In June 1932, one of the worst months of political violence, there were more than 400 street battles, resulting in 82 deaths. Hitler's appointment as Chancellor, followed by the suppression of all political parties except the Nazis, did not end the violence of the stormtroopers. Deprived of Communist Party meetings to disrupt, the stormtroopers would sometimes run riot in the streets after a night of drinking. They would attack passers-by, and then attack the police who were called to stop them. Complaints of overbearing and loudish behavior by stormtroopers became common by the middle of 1933. The Foreign Office even complained of instances where brownshirts manhandled foreign diplomats. Hitler's move would be to strengthen his position with the army by moving against its nemesis, the SA. On July 6, 1933, at a gathering of high-ranking Nazi officials, Hitler declared the success of the National Socialist, or Nazi, Brown Revolution. Now that the NSDAP had seized the reins of power in Germany, he said, it was time to consolidate its control. Hitler told the gathered officials, The stream of revolution has been undammed, but it must be channeled into the secure bed of evolution. Hitler's speech signaled his intention to reign in the SA, whose ranks had grown rapidly in the early 1930s. This would not prove to be simple, however, as the SA made up a large part of Nazism's most devoted followers. The SA traced its dramatic rise in numbers in part to the onset of the Great Depression, when many German citizens lost both their jobs and their faith in traditional institutions. While Nazism was not exclusively, or even primarily, a working class phenomenon, the SA fulfilled the yearning of many unemployed workers for class solidarity and nationalist fervor. Many stormtroopers believed in the socialist promise of national socialism and expected the Nazi regime to take more radical economic action, such as breaking up the vast landed estates of the aristocracy. When the Nazi regime did not take such steps, those who had expected an economic as well as a political revolution were disillusioned. Conflict between the army and the SA No one in the SA spoke more loudly for a continuation of the German Revolution, as one prominent stormtrooper put it, than Rome. Rome, as one of the earliest members of the Nazi Party, had participated in the Munich Beer Hall Putsch, an attempt by Hitler to seize power by force in 1923. A combat veteran of World War I, Rome had recently boasted that he would execute 12 men in retaliation for the killing of any stormtrooper. Rome saw violence as a means to political ends. He took seriously the socialist promise of National Socialism, and demanded that Hitler and the other party leaders initiate wide-ranging socialist reform in Germany. Not content solely with the leadership of the SA, Rome lobbied Hitler to appoint him Minister of Defense, a position held by the conservative General Werner von Blomberg. Although nicknamed the Rubber Lion by some of his critics in the army for his devotion to Hitler, Blomberg was not a Nazi, and therefore represented a bridge between the army and the party. Blomberg and many of his fellow officers were recruited from the Prussian nobility, and regarded the SA as a plebeian rabble that threatened the army's traditional high status in German society. If the regular army showed contempt for the masses belonging to the SA, many stormtroopers returned the feeling, seeing the army as insufficiently committed to the National Socialist Revolution. Max Hedebrick, an SA leader in Rummelsburg, denounced the army to his fellow brownshirts, telling them, Some of the officers of the army are swine. 
Most officers are too old and have to be replaced by young ones. We want to wait till Papa Hindenburg is dead, and then the SA will march against the army." Despite such hostility between the brownshirts and the regular army, Blomberg and others in the military saw the SA as a source of raw recruits for an enlarged and revitalized army. Rome, however, wanted to eliminate the generalship of the Prussian aristocracy altogether, using the SA to become the core of a new German military. With the army limited by the Treaty of Versailles to 100,000 soldiers, its leaders watched anxiously as membership in the SA surpassed 3 million men by the beginning of 1934. In January 1934, Rome presented Blomberg with a memorandum demanding that the SA replace the regular army as the nation's ground forces, and that the Reichswehr become a training adjunct to the SA. In response, Hitler met Blomberg and the leadership of the SA and SS on February 28, 1934. Under pressure from Hitler, Rome reluctantly signed a pledge stating that he recognized the supremacy of the Reichswehr over the SA. Hitler announced to those present that the SA would act as an auxiliary to the Reichswehr, not the other way around. After Hitler and most of the army officers had left, however, Rome declared that he would not take instructions from the ridiculous corporal, a demeaning reference to Hitler. While Hitler did not take immediate action against Rome for his intemperate outburst, it nonetheless deepened the rift between them. <laughs> Growing pressure against the SA Despite his earlier agreement with Hitler, Rome still clung to his vision of a new German army with the SA at its core. By early 1934, this vision directly conflicted with Hitler's plan to consolidate power and expand the Reichswehr. Because their plans for the army conflicted, Rome's success could come only at Hitler's expense. Moreover, it was not just the Reichswehr that viewed the SA as a threat. Several of Hitler's lieutenants feared Rome's growing power and restlessness, as did Hitler. As a result, a political struggle within the party grew, with those closest to Hitler, including Prussian Premier Hermann Göring, Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels, Reichsfuhrer SS Heinrich Himmler, and Hitler's deputy Rudolf Hess, positioning themselves against Rome. While all of these men were veterans of the Nazi movement, only Rome continued to demonstrate his independence from, rather than his loyalty to, Adolf Hitler. Rome's contempt for the party's bureaucracy angered Hess. SA violence in Prussia gravely concerned Göring, minister-president of Prussia. Finally in the spring of 1934, the growing rift between Rome and Hitler over the role of the SA in the Nazi state led the former Chancellor, General Kurt von Schleicher, to start playing politics again. Schleicher criticized the current Hitler cabinet while some of Schleicher's followers such as General Ferdinand von Bredow and Werner von Alvensleben started passing along lists of a new Hitler cabinet in which Schleicher would become Vice-Chancellor, Rome Minister of Defense, Heinrich Brüning Foreign Minister and Gregor Strasser Minister of National Economy. The British historian Sir John Wheeler Bennett, who knew Schleicher and his circle well, wrote that Bredow displayed a lack of discretion that was terrifying as he went about showing the list of the proposed cabinet to anyone who was interested. Although Schleicher was in fact unimportant by 1934, increasingly wild rumors that he was scheming with Rome to re-enter the corridors of power helped stoke the sense of crisis, as a means of isolating Rome. On April 20, 1934, Göring transferred control of the Prussian political police Gestapo to Himmler, who, Göring believed, could be counted on to move against Rome. Himmler envied the independence and power of the SA, although by this time he and his deputy Reinhard Heydrich had already begun restructuring the SS from a bodyguard formation for Nazi leaders and a subset of the SA into its own independent elite corps, one loyal to both himself and Hitler. The loyalty of the SS men would prove useful to both when Hitler finally chose to move against Rome and the SA. By May, lists of those to be liquidated started to circulate amongst Göring and Himmler's people, who engaged in a trade, adding enemies of one in exchange for sparing friends of the other. At the end of May two former chancellors, Heinrich Brüning and Kurt von Schleicher, received warnings from friends in the Reichswehr that their lives were in danger and they should leave Germany at once. Brüning fled to the Netherlands while Schleicher dismissed the tip-off as a bad practical joke. By the beginning of June everything was set and all that was needed was permission from Hitler. Demands for Hitler to constrain the SA strengthened. Conservatives in the army, industry, and politics placed Hitler under increasing pressure to reduce the influence of the SA and to move against Rome. 
While Rome's homosexuality did not endear him to conservatives, they were more concerned about his political ambitions. Hitler for his part remained indecisive and uncertain about just what precisely he wanted to do when he left for Venice to meet Benito Mussolini on June 15. Before Hitler left, and at the request of Presidential State Secretary Otto Minor, Foreign Minister Baron Konstantin von Neurath ordered the German ambassador to Italy Ulrich von Hassel, without Hitler's knowledge, to ask Mussolini to tell Hitler that the SA was blackening Germany's good name. Neurath's maneuver to put pressure on Hitler paid off, with Mussolini agreeing to the request Neurath was a former ambassador to Italy, and knew Mussolini well. During the summit in Venice, Mussolini upbraided Hitler for tolerating the violence, hooliganism, and homosexuality of the SA, which Mussolini stated were ruining Hitler's good reputation all over the world. Mussolini used the affair occasioned by the murder of Giacomo Matteotti as an example of the kind of trouble unruly followers could cause a dictator. While Mussolini's criticism did not win Hitler over to acting against the SA, it helped push him in that direction. On June 17, 1934, conservative demands for Hitler to act came to a head when Vice Chancellor Franz von Papen, confidant of the ailing Hindenburg, gave a speech at Marburg University warning of the threat of a second revolution. Privately, according to his memoirs, von Papen, a Catholic aristocrat with ties to army and industry, threatened to resign if Hitler did not act. While von Papen's resignation as vice-chancellor would not have threatened Hitler's position, it would have nonetheless been an embarrassing display of independence from a leading conservative. <laughs> Heydrich and Himmler In response to conservative pressure to constrain Rome, Hitler left for Nudek to meet with Hindenburg. Blomberg, who had been meeting with the president, uncharacteristically reproached Hitler for not having moved against Rome earlier. He then told Hitler that Hindenburg was close to declaring martial law and turning the government over to the Reichswehr if Hitler did not take immediate steps against Rome and his brownshirts. Hitler had hesitated for months in moving against Rome, in part due to Rome's visibility as the leader of a national militia with millions of members. However, the threat of a declaration of martial law from Hindenburg, the only person in Germany with the authority to potentially depose the Nazi regime, put Hitler under pressure to act. He left Nudek with the intention of both destroying Rome and settling scores with old enemies. Both Himmler and Göring welcomed Hitler's decision, since both had much to gain by Rome's downfall, the independence of the SS for Himmler, and the removal of a rival for the future command of the army for Göring. In preparation for the purge, both Himmler and Reinhard Heydrich, chief of the SS security service, assembled a dossier of manufactured evidence to suggest that Rome had been paid 12 million Reichsmark .6 million Euros in 2018 by France to overthrow Hitler. Leading officers in the SS were shown falsified evidence on June 24 that Rome planned to use the SA to launch a plot against the government Rome Putsch. At Hitler's direction, Göring, Himmler, Heydrich, and Victor Lutz drew up lists of people in and outside the SA to be killed. One of the men Göring recruited to assist him was Willy Lehmann, a Gestapo official and NKVD spy. On June 25, General Werner von Fritsch placed the Reichswehr on the highest level of alert. On June 27, Hitler moved to secure the army's cooperation. Blomberg and General Walther von Reichenau, the army's liaison to the party, gave it to him by expelling Rome from the German Offices League. On June 28 Hitler went to Essen to attend a wedding celebration and reception, from there he called Rome's adjutant at Bad Wiesi and ordered SA leaders to meet with him on June 30 at 11 h. On June 29, a signed article in Völkischer Beobachter by Blomberg appeared in which Blomberg stated with great fervor that the Reichswehr stood behind Hitler. <inaudible> Purge At about 4.30 on June 30, 1934, Hitler and his entourage flew into Munich. From the airport they drove to the Bavarian Interior Ministry, where they assembled the leaders of an SA rampage that had taken place in city streets the night before. Enraged, Hitler tore the epaulettes off the shirt of Obergruppenführer August Schneidhuber, the chief of the Munich police, for failing to keep order in the city on the previous night. Hitler shouted at Schneidhuber and accused him of treachery. Schneidhuber was executed later that day. As the stormtroopers were hustled off to prison, Hitler assembled a large group of SS and regular police, and departed for the Hanselbauer Hotel in Bad Wiesi, where Ernst Röhm and his followers were staying. 
With Hitler's arrival in Bad Wiese between 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock, the SA leadership, still in bed, were taken by surprise. SS men stormed the hotel and Hitler personally placed Rome and other high-ranking SA leaders under arrest. According to Eric Kempka, Hitler turned Rome over to two detectives holding pistols with the safety catch removed. The SS found Breslau SA leader Edmund Heinz in bed with an unidentified 18-year-old male SA senior troop leader. Goebbels emphasized this aspect in subsequent propaganda justifying the purge as a crackdown on moral turpitude. Hitler ordered both Heinz and his partner taken outside the hotel and shot. Meanwhile, the SS arrested the other SA leaders as they left their train for the planned meeting with Rome and Hitler. Although Hitler presented no evidence of a plot by Rome to overthrow the regime, he nevertheless denounced the leadership of the SA. Arriving back at party headquarters in Munich, Hitler addressed the assembled crowd. Consumed with rage, Hitler denounced, the worst treachery in world history. Hitler told the crowd that, undisciplined and disobedient characters and asocial or diseased elements would be annihilated. The crowd, which included party members and many SA members fortunate enough to escape arrest, shouted its approval. Hess, present among the assembled, even volunteered to shoot the traitors. Joseph Goebbels, who had been with Hitler at Bad Wiese, set the final phase of the plan in motion. Upon returning to Berlin, Goebbels telephoned Göring at 10 o'clock with the codeword Calibri to let loose the execution squads on the rest of their unsuspecting victims. Sepp Dietrich received orders from Hitler for the Liebstandarte to form an execution squad and go to Stadelheim prison where certain SA leaders were being held. There in the prison courtyard, the Liebstandarte firing squad shot five SA generals and an SA colonel. Those not immediately executed were taken back to the Liebstandarte barracks at Lichterfeld, given one minute trials, and shot by a firing squad. <laughs> <laughs> Against conservatives and old enemies The regime did not limit itself to a purge of the SAW. Having earlier imprisoned or exiled prominent Social Democrats and Communists, Hitler used the occasion to move against conservatives he considered unreliable. This included Vice-Chancellor Papen and those in his immediate circle. In Berlin, on Göring's personal orders, an armed SS unit stormed the Vice-Chancellery. Gestapo officers attached to the SS unit shot Papen's secretary Herbert von Bose without bothering to arrest him first. The Gestapo arrested and later executed Papen's close associate Edgar Jung, the author of Papen's Marburg speech, and disposed of his body by dumping it in a ditch. The Gestapo also murdered Erich Klausener, the leader of Catholic Action, and a close Papen associate. Papen was unceremoniously arrested at the Vice Chancellery, despite his insistent protests that he could not be arrested in his position as Vice Chancellor. Although Hitler ordered him released days later, Papen no longer dared to criticize the regime and was sent off to Vienna as German ambassador. Hitler and Himmler unleashed the Gestapo against old enemies, as well. Both Kurt von Schleicher, Hitler's predecessor as Chancellor, and his wife were murdered at their home. Others killed included Gregor Strasser, a former Nazi who had angered Hitler by resigning from the party in 1932, and Gustav Ritter von Kahr, the former Bavarian state commissioner who crushed the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923. Kahr's fate was especially gruesome. His body was found in a wood outside Munich, he had been hacked to death, apparently with pickaxes. The murdered included at least one accidental victim, Willy Schmid, the music critic of the Münchner Neustnerkricken newspaper. As Himmler's adjutant Karl Wolf later explained, friendship and personal loyalty were not allowed to stand in the way. Among others, a charming fellow named Karl von Spreti, Rome's personal adjutant. He held the same position with Rome as I held with Himmler. He died with words, Heil Hitler, on his lips. We were close personal friends, we often dined together in Berlin. He lifted his arm in the Nazi salute and called out, Heil Hitler, I love Germany. Some SA members died saying, Heil Hitler, because they believed that an anti-Hitler SS plot had led to their execution. Several leaders of the disbanded Catholic Center Party were also murdered in the purge. The party had generally been aligned with the Social Democrats and Catholic Church during the rise of Nazism, being critical of Nazi ideology, but voting nonetheless for the Enabling Act of 1933 which granted Hitler dictatorial authority.
Topic: <laughs> Rome's fate. Rome was held briefly at Stadelheim prison in Munich, while Hitler considered his future. In the end, Hitler decided that Rome had to die. On July 1, at Hitler's behest, Theodor Eich, commandant of the Dachau concentration camp, and his SS adjutant Michel Lippert visited Rome. Once inside Rome's cell, they handed him a Browning pistol loaded with a single bullet and told him he had ten minutes to kill himself or they would do it for him. Rome demurred, telling them. If I am to be killed, let Adolf do it himself." Having heard nothing in the allotted time, they returned to Rome's cell at 1450 to find him standing, with his bare chest puffed out in a gesture of defiance. Eich and Lippert then shot Rome, killing him. In 1957, the German authorities tried Lippert in Munich for Rome's murder. Until then, Lippert had been one of the few executioners of the purge to evade trial. Lippert was convicted and sentenced to 18 months in prison. Topic. Aftermath As the purge claimed the lives of so many prominent Germans, it could hardly be kept secret. At first, its architects seemed split on how to handle the event. Goring instructed police stations to burn all documents concerning the action of the past two days. Meanwhile, Goebbels tried to prevent newspapers from publishing lists of the dead, but at the same time used a July 2 radio address to describe how Hitler had narrowly prevented Rome and Schleicher from overthrowing the government and throwing the country into turmoil. Then, on July 13, 1934, Hitler justified the purge in a nationally broadcast speech to the Reichstag. If anyone reproaches me and asks why I did not resort to the regular courts of justice, then all I can say is this. In this hour I was responsible for the fate of the German people, and thereby I became the supreme judge of the German people. I gave the order to shoot the ringleaders in this treason, and I further gave the order to cauterize down to the raw flesh the ulcers of this poisoning of the wells in our domestic life. Let the nation know that its existence—which depends on its internal order and security—cannot be threatened with impunity by anyone. And let it be known for all time to come that if anyone raises his hand to strike the state, then certain death is his lot. Concerned with presenting the massacre as legally sanctioned, Hitler had the cabinet approve a measure on July 3 that declared, The measures taken on June 30, July 1 and 2 to suppress treasonous assaults are legal as acts of self-defense by the state. Reich Justice Minister Franz Gertner, a conservative who had been Bavarian Justice Minister in the years of the Weimar Republic, demonstrated his loyalty to the new regime by drafting the statute, which added a legal veneer to the purge. Signed into law by Hitler, Gertner, and Minister of the Interior Wilhelm Frick, the law regarding measures of state self-defense retroactively legalized the murders committed during the purge. Germany's legal establishment further capitulated to the regime when the country's leading legal scholar, Karl Schmidt, wrote an article defending Hitler's July 13 speech. It was named, The Führer Upholds the Law. <laughs> Reaction Almost unanimously, the army applauded the Night of the Long Knives, even though the generals Kurt von Schleicher and Ferdinand von Bredow were among the victims. The ailing President Hindenburg, Germany's highly revered military hero, sent a telegram expressing his profoundly felt gratitude and congratulated Hitler for nipping treason in the bud. General von Reichenau went so far as to publicly give credence to the lie that Schleicher had been plotting to overthrow the government. In his speech to the Reichstag on July 13 justifying his actions, Hitler denounced Schleicher for conspiring with Ernst Rome to overthrow the government. Hitler alleged both were traitors working in the pay of France. Since Schleicher was a good friend of the French ambassador André François Ponset, and because of his reputation for intrigue, the claim that Schleicher was working for France had enough surface plausibility for most Germans to accept it. François Ponset was not declared persona non grata as would have been usual if an ambassador were involved in a plot against his host government. The army's support for the purge, however, would have far-reaching consequences for the institution. The humbling of the saw ended the threat it had posed to the army but, by standing by Hitler during the purge, the army bound itself more tightly to the Nazi regime. One retired captain, Erwin Planck, seemed to realize this. If you look on without lifting a finger. He said to his friend, General Werner von Fritsch, You will meet the same fate sooner or later. 
Another rare exception was Field Marshal August von Mackensen, who spoke about the murders of Schleicher and Bredo at the annual General Staff Society meeting in February 1935 after they had been rehabilitated by Hitler in early January 1935. Rumors about the Night of the Long Knives rapidly spread. Although many Germans approached the official news of the events as described by Joseph Goebbels with a great deal of skepticism, many others took the regime at its word, and believed that Hitler had saved Germany from a descent into chaos. Louise Solmitz, a Hamburg schoolteacher, echoed the sentiments of many Germans when she cited Hitler's personal courage, decisiveness and effectiveness in her private diary. She even compared him to Frederick the Great, the 18th century King of Prussia. Others were appalled at the scale of the executions and at the relative complacency of many of their fellow Germans. A very calm and easy going mailman, the diarist Victor Klemperer wrote, who is not at all national socialist, said, well, he simply sentenced them. It did not escape Klemperer's notice that many of the victims had played a role in bringing Hitler to power. A chancellor, he wrote sentences and shoots members of his own private army." The extent of the massacre and the relative ubiquity of the Gestapo, however, meant that those who disapproved of the purge generally kept quiet about it. Among the few exceptions were General Kurt von Hammerstein Accord and Field Marshal August von Mackensen, who started a campaign to have Schleicher rehabilitated by Hitler. Hammerstein, who was a close friend of Schleicher, had been much offended at Schleicher's funeral when the SS refused to allow him to attend the service and confiscated the wreaths that the mourners had brought. Besides working for the rehabilitation of Schleicher and Bredow, Hammerstein and Mackensen sent a memo to Hindenburg on July 18 setting out in considerable detail the circumstances of the murders of the two generals and noted that Papen had barely escaped. The memo went on to demand that Hindenburg punish those responsible, and criticized Blomberg for his outspoken support of the murders of Schleicher and Bredo. Finally, Hammerstein and Mackensen asked that Hindenburg reorganize the government by firing Baron Konstantin von Neurath, Robert Ley, Hermann Göring, Werner von Blomberg, Joseph Goebbels and Richard Walther Dere from the cabinet. Instead, the memo asked that Hindenburg create a directorate to rule Germany comprising the Chancellor who was not named, General Werner von Fritsch as Vice-Chancellor, Hammerstein as Minister of Defense, the Minister for National Economy also unnamed, and Rudolf Nadolny as Foreign Minister. The request that Neurath be replaced by Nadolny, the former ambassador to Moscow who had resigned earlier that year in protest against Hitler's anti-Soviet foreign policy, indicated that Hammerstein and Mackensen wanted a return to the distant friendliness towards the Soviet Union that existed until 1933. Mackensen and Hammerstein ended their memo with Excellency, the gravity of the moment has compelled us to appeal to you as our supreme commander. The destiny of our country is at stake. Your Excellency has thrice before saved Germany from foundering, at Tannenberg, at the end of the war and at the moment of your election as Reich President. Excellency, save Germany for the fourth time. The undersigned generals and senior officers swear to preserve to the last breath their loyalty to you and the fatherland. Hindenburg never responded to the memo, and it remains unclear whether he even saw it, as Otto Minor, who decided that his future was aligned with the Nazis, may not have passed it along. It is noteworthy that even those officers who were most offended by the killings, like Hammerstein and Mackensen, did not blame the purge on Hitler, whom they wanted to see continue as Chancellor, and at most wanted a reorganization of the cabinet to remove some of Hitler's more radical followers. In late 1934 early 1935, Werner von Fritsch and Werner von Blomberg, who had been shamed into joining Hammerstein and Mackensen's rehabilitation campaign, successfully pressured Hitler into rehabilitating generals von Schleicher and von Bredow. Fritsch and Blomberg suddenly now claimed at the end of 1934 that as army officers they could not stand the exceedingly violent press attacks on Schleicher and Bredo that had been going on since July, which portrayed them as the vilest traitors, working against the fatherland in the pay of France. In a speech given on January 3, 1935 at the Berlin State Opera, Hitler stated that Schleicher and Bredo had been shot in error on the basis of false information, and that their names were to be restored to the honor rolls of their regiments at once. Hitler's speech was not reported in the German press, but the army was appeased by the speech. However, despite the rehabilitation of the two murdered officers, the Nazis continued in private to accuse Schleicher of high treason. 
During a trip to Warsaw in January 1935, Göring told Jan Zembeck that Schleicher had urged Hitler in January 1933 to reach an understanding with France and the Soviet Union, and partition Poland with the latter, and Hitler had Schleicher killed out of disgust with the alleged advice. During a meeting with Polish ambassador Józef Lipski on May 22, 1935, Hitler told Lipski that Schleicher was rightfully murdered, if only because he had sought to maintain the Rapallo Treaty. Quote, the statements that Schleicher had been killed because he wanted to partition Poland with the Soviet Union were later published in the Polish White Book of 1939, which was a collection of diplomatic documents detailing German-Polish relations up to the outbreak of the war. Former Kaiser Wilhelm II, who was in exile in Dorn, Netherlands, was horrified by the purge. He asked, What would people have said if I had done such a thing? Hearing of the murder of former Chancellor Kurt von Schleicher and his wife, he also commented, We have ceased to live under the rule of law and everyone must be prepared for the possibility that the Nazis will push their way in and put them up against the wall. <laughs> Saw leadership Hitler named Victor Lutz to replace Rome as head of the Saw. Hitler ordered him, as one prominent historian described it, to put an end to "...homosexuality, debauchery, drunkenness, and high living." In the SAW, Hitler expressly told him to stop SAW funds from being spent on limousines and banquets, which he considered evidence of SAW extravagance. Lutz did little to assert the SAW's independence in the coming years, and the SAW lost its power in Germany. Membership in the organization plummeted from 2.9 million in August 1934 to 1.2 million in April 1938, according to Speer. The right, represented by the president, the minister of justice, and the generals, lined up behind Hitler. The strong left wing of the party, represented chiefly by the SA, was eliminated. The Night of the Long Knives represented a triumph for Hitler, and a turning point for the German government. It established Hitler as the supreme leader of the German people, as he put it in his July 13 speech to the Reichstag. Hitler formally adopted this title in April 1942, thus placing himself de jure as well as de facto above the reach of the law. Centuries of jurisprudence proscribing extrajudicial killings were swept aside. Despite some initial efforts by local prosecutors to take legal action against those who carried out the murders, which the regime rapidly quashed, it appeared that no law would constrain Hitler in his use of power. The Night of the Long Knives also sent a clear message to the public that even the most prominent Germans were not immune from arrest or even summary execution should the Nazi regime perceive them as a threat. In this manner, the purge established a pattern of violence that would characterize the Nazi regime. Rome was purged from all Nazi propaganda, such as The Victory of Faith, the Leni Riefenstahl film about the 1933 Nuremberg rally, which showed Rome frequently alongside Hitler. A copy of the original survived and was found in the United Kingdom many years later. See also The Damned 1969 film Glossary of Nazi Germany List of Nazi Party leaders and officials Der Sieg des Glaubens Victims of the Night of the Long Knives White Book of the Purge